conversations. And I want to talk about um, dialogue about the subject of, of the video I asked you to watch for today. On what subject was that video focused? You could say. What, what were we talking about in that video? Sorry? Quality assurance. Yeah, quality assurance testing. Good. Yeah, name? Uh, e. E. Okay, thank you. That's right, E. Um, and there's a particular focus there on achieving better ability to test. Do you remember the word associated with that, anyone? Testability, testability. So, Sounds like a buzzword, but it, it actually has a lot of specifics associated. It's, it's actually very, well, it may sound very, very, very squishy. It, it, the ways in which you build testability are, are very concrete. They're very specific. Um, so if I say, if I ask you, what is testability? Can anyone say? What, what, is, what does the word testability mean? If I say the testability of the system is very low, just as a sanity check, what am I talking about? Juan. In what measure can the system be tested? Yeah, to what yeah, to what degree is it is it effectively testable, right? What's its uh, ease of be, of of testing? Um why do we care about testability? That's the what, why. Why do we care about it? Speak on it. Because if you cannot test the program or code that you wrote, you cannot find uh, issues or problems that uh, may really that may result in failure. That's right. Because so much of project success in software hinges around quality delivery. You may recall on this very blackboard, not three weeks then, I drew a triangle. Does anyone remember what that triangle was called? Uh, uh, so name over here. Yes, N name? Marcus, uh, iron. iron triangle, that's right. And it had three vertices, it had three, three corners. And what were those corners? Yes, uh, 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 Danielle. Uh, so, scope cost time. that's right, scope cost time. And the idea was we can achieve any one of them very readily. Two of them we can achieve by often sacrificing the third. But to achieve all three, scope, staying within budget, and finishing it with them on time, it's really hard. But one of the things that can foster all three is good investment in quality. And to achieve quality, one of our key tools, not the only one, but a key one is the ability to test our system. Because testing helps us engage, amongst other things, in risk management about the technical side of our project, right? Um, it's easy to think you're making progress because code is being written, but if there's tremendous amounts of quality issues with that code, we may be doing the equivalent of slaking our thirst by drinking seawater, right? We think we're making progress, we're doing great things, and oh boy, that seawater tastes good. You know, I feel less thirsty. But it, it's going to worsen your thirst, right? It's going to drag out the time if your code is full of bugs. Um, and one of the defenses against that is our ability to test key diagnostics. Testing can also help us localize, find problems that we can then zero in on debugging. So testability is absolutely key to our ability to test. So I told you, I, I remarked that testability sounds squishy, sounds vague, sounds very high level, but it actually, the ways in which we build testability are very concrete. So can you give me some ways that we build testability, that we enhance the ability to test our system? What sort of actions that we take, what sort of investments, what sort of technical practices um, help build testability of our system? Anyone? Tony? Logging helps build testability. That's right. It can give us diagnostic messages, messages that can be throttled up in level of detail and brought back down. 
That's excellent. What's what's another investment in, in testimony? Um, uh, yes, Jesse. Stubs, use of stubs or monks or pigs. You can they go by different names, and there's actually somewhat different conventions used for speaking about them in different areas. Sometimes stubs are used as kind of placeholder code that that's just there temporarily, whereas uh, mocks are more savvy about about testing the things that are passed into them and ensuring that you know that if if, if the code that they're replacing right now, they're standing in for, should only be called once because it's initialization code that the mock is only called once and may test that, you know, the arguments passed in are non null, right? Um, it may test, test that they don't duplicate each other, et cetera. Um, so often mocks are like an intelligent form of stubs, but you know, you could, I'd go by calling them stubs. Okay, sure. Um, it's often about having this placeholder code that allows us to intelligently test how that code is being used, but also, also about you know having to place something for that code so neighboring systems can be can be tested um, on their own with some level of isolation. So that's really good, Jesse. How about another type of investment we talked about? That will help build testability. And uh, 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 Quinn? No. Okay. Sander. Sander. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, do you have a hat that says Xander? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Xander. Yes. Test harnesses and drivers. So, so when I say a test harness, what do I mean? What do I mean by test harness? Uh, yes, Xander. It's, I think the name is Xander. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. That's right. So you need some way of to, to really test effectively often. You need some way of sort of setting, getting the system ready, and being able to then go and test one thing after the other, right? And Sometimes this sounds easier than it really is. There may be portions of your code. Like maybe you're dealing with an Oculus visual representation of some space. And you know, how do we how do we like have a you know a test harness to kind of set that up to view it from a given angle and try out different tests with it, right? That's sometimes it's not obvious. Um uh, or maybe you're you're dealing with some sort of front end UI issue, and you want to test it under under different contexts. Um, and so sometimes it's not obvious, but but often um, our ability to run tests depend on some sort of framework, some sort of scaffolding that you know calls often. So Xander's exactly right. Um, these these sort of drivers or or harnesses that that can run our tests are, are often key. Sometimes those tests are system tests and they test whole use cases or use of stories. Sometimes they're just unit tests and we, we need to invoke each of them. Okay, good. What's, what's another test um, in, uh, type of thing that can enhance testability? Yes, Tony. Uh, assertions. assertions. Why do I say that can enhance testability? <laughs> How does it help our testing? Uh, the name is Kamal. Uh, it increases certainty and our trust in certain like, assumptions that you make, so you don't have to double check for them. That's right. So it, first of all, it, it validates assumptions which are typically depended on by the code. So if that assertion, if that assertion fails, if that assumption doesn't hold. This criteria is not true. This property is not true. It suggests there's going to be a defect in the code because you know you you often put in place assertions when you're counting on those properties being true. You're counting on this criteria being satisfied because your code counts on it. 
it comes from the fact that I that I is always less than J, or that I is always greater than or equal to zero. Maybe it writes to that location in an array with I as its index. And, and if it's less than zero, there's going to be a defect, right? And so you, you test it. So you put in place these assertions that check your reasoning. And if that reasoning has failed, the assertion will fail. And it, it's an indication that there's going to be some problem in that code. It's going to be a defect. Let's suppose you didn't, you, you may say, well, let's suppose we left that assertion out. What's the problem? Wouldn't we find that through some other mechanism? What's the problem with, I mean, wh why does an assertion help us find that sooner? Yes, Daniel. One last thing to check is make that assumption. That's right. Yeah, you could check it. You can, you can definitely check it. You don't have to wait for some error message to come up. And who knows if it would actually be caught. I mean, bad values might be written in the database that your tests for all their many virtues that no doubt will recommend them. Um, never check. There may be things that would have slipped through the cracks and this is the way to find it. But it's also the assertion is, how does the assertion help debugging? Because it's what? Remember, Testing finds what? Failures and peer reviews find faults. If there's some underlying fault underlying a failure, uh, being it an assertion could, could be that fails or, you know, the, the system crashes or it hangs or it, you know, it writes corrupt data to disk or it, it you know, gives the wrong answer or whatever. Some failure, some notable incorrect behavior. If, if, if that's going to occur, you're putting in place an assertion lets that happen much sooner, much closer to the fault, typically. We bring the point of failure much closer, which helps debugging. We may discover it more or less immediately after the failure, like two lines later, where there's the assertion that I is greater than J or whatever. Um, Rather than only discovering it days later when we notice some weird, you know, weird data in the database or whatever. Okay, what's another way to enhance testability? Uh, yes, uh, name. No, no. Test hooks. Yeah, what's a, what's a test hook? It's a test hook. Sounds like a character in Peter Pan. What's a test hook? Uh, yes, Tony. Uh, I, I say it's uh, it's like assertion, but it could modify the say of the the whole program. Yeah. So, so uh, a test hook is often a tool, like like with assertions, for checking that some criteria is made. So there's many types of test hooks. Some of them are designed towards just test confirming that the system is in a consistent state, that a certain property is guaranteed. For example, that a database table has no repeat entries in it, um, uh, or um, that a, uh, a half table has no, has no empty contents for the entries, um, or that the keys in that table are all in uppercase or whatever, a string. Right, um, there's no duplicates that that are, are are in a array or what have you. That the elements of the array are sorted that you've been given. These are things you can test. These are properties that you can test, right? And test hooks can be used when you want testing to be able to confirm these things. And maybe you have a class, and inside it has an array as a field that you know, maintains an array. And you have a test hook that's a method whose job it is not to, this method's job is not to actually serve the main execution of the program. It's, its job in life is to serve testing by confirming that this criteria holds, that this, that this class is in a sane state, that it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, in a state which is, uh, uh, which accords with, with the plans. Um, that it matches some guarantees for this class. 
Um, that's that's often really good because you know we're often counting on on a class behaving well. And one way we can test it is call its methods, like the rest of the program calls its methods, and test if the results are given back or are giving back reasonable answers. That's one way to test it. But often we want to do more than that. Often we kind of want to peer into the internals of that class and say, hey, you know, is this in a sane state? Are all these criteria holding for this class? That this table is, you know, the size of the table matches this other number in the class, that there are no duplicates in this place, that this array is in the correct order, that this field uh, that only one of these two fields, this one or this one, is ever non-null or whatever. We have these criteria, and we we ask that we we. It's almost like we have an interface for the class for the rest of the program to build build the system. Right, that's a normal one. But then we have an interface for it, and I, I'm speaking either figuratively or literally, that exposes testing criteria, like like test hooks things that you could do when testing, it's useful information to have about this. Um, you might even do things like ask the class, you might keep track of how many times certain things have been called for the class and have an, have an interface for reading that out for testing, right? Um, you, so you can call the class and say, hey, are you indeed called? What's your initialization method called? And the class says, no, ma'am. And, and you say, aha, there's a bug here. So often we put logic, mark my words, we put logic into our code, not merely to serve the construction of the rest of the program, but to serve testing, to build confidence that the program's working correctly, that the right things are being done, right things are being called in order or what have you, that this has been properly initialized. That can be really useful. So test hooks serve a really good purpose. What are some other ways? These are very concrete things. What are some other ways that we can build, build confidence by testing, that we, that we can enhance our testing? We spoke about some of them last time, and I see Evander um, raising his hand. Uh, crash reports. Crash reports, exactly what I was thinking. It read my mind. That's awesome. Uh, crash analytics. So they can give us, this one is um, putting technologies in place that will help us make much better use of the opportunities to learn if things crash. We don't want things to crash, but if they're going to, let's make the most of it by learning what caused the crash. It's distressing to have a crash caused and you have no idea what caused it. You have no idea why it failed. You can put technologies in place that will whisper to you about why it failed, give you good hints about where it failed. That's like gold. Do, do you see that point? Because it can turn it from a sleuthing that takes you all night to something that takes you five minutes because you know, oh, okay, look, it failed at this point. And, um, and we know why that was. It was because the system was really low on disk space or whatever. What's, what's another thing that can really help testing? Yes, uh, and is that, uh, is that Yi in the back? Yes. I have a question for the, for the question. Like, is this, this would be a part of the uh, logging or? Crash reports? Yeah. Well, you can think of it, thank you, uh, Yi. Um, you can think of it as kind of a form of logging, if, if you'd like to do so. It's a form of logging which, so, so um, one of the things I, I, I spoke about to this class last time was that some law, so one of the advantages of logging is that you can change at runtime. While the program is, system is running, you can change logging. That's really useful for debugging. For test. You, you have a logging only warnings and errors to a certain point, and then you ramp it up. So you can study in detail what's going on just prior to that crash or what's going on prior to that error message. You see my point? Yeah, yeah. Before it hangs. This is really useful. Um, and uh, so there, there are times where sometimes we put in place logging for very specific purposes. Um, we, we have 
sort of special login. We can do that with test hooks, for example. Have a test hook that enables this very detailed logging of something, right? We call it um, when we need it. And you could think of crash reports as, as one of these kind of contingent logging scenarios, these dynamic logging scenarios where under a very specific condition, in this case, a bad condition of a, of a, of a crash, you enable logging. Now, one of the reasons, so so I think that's true. I think that's not a, you know, that's not a too big a stretch. But what I will say is, he, one of the reasons I'm singling it out, crash reports, is that there's grown up to be a whole set of technologies, technologies for doing it on Android, for doing it on iOS, technologies for doing it for web servers, of various sorts, for crash reports, and um. The very specific technologies that will gather quite specialized types of information um, uh, for the appropriate context and then send it back at some level to the development team, whether it's through HTTPS posts or you know via email messages or or writing it out to to disk and then you know, having the person send it off uh, via mail or whatever it is, um, uh, posting it via SSH or what have you, but it, it transports it back to the dev team. And there are products you can purchase like Crashlytics that will not only let you set up those tools to give the right sort of information, they let you, they give the dev team, the development team and the test team, the ability to, inspect uh, all the crash reports that have been reported um, for this product, organize them, go through them, classify them, sort them, you know, rank them by frequency, um, sort them by what operating system they're occurring under, et cetera. And this gives real situational awareness to the, to the team. Like it, it lets them know, where is our product failing? Under what conditions? On what platforms? Where in the system? How often? You know, what are the natures of the stresses like low memory conditions, disk space full, or what have you that our system is, is facing? How is this changing as we roll out a new version of our system, right? We, we post a new version that we think has fixed these. Are they still occurring? This is, again, this is like gold, right? To know, I mean, because by contrast, it's like a nightmare for me as a software engineer to think like if one of our smartphone-based apps is crashing and I don't know about it, I sure as heck want to know if users are encountering crashes. And I want to be able to zero in on what caused those crashes. Maybe it's for reach out to the users, but often it's to fix the issue and post a fix, right? Um, this is one of the real virtues of crash reports. So crash reports have a, a, a special urgency to them. Often, often logging is meant to empower testing and debugging and, and, and you know, dev team awareness. But crash reports you know, often get into user deployed code where maybe logging would commonly be disabled or at a minimum level. Um, uh, think about Logcat on Android or something, um, and and crash reports, you know, uh, deal with the reality that in user deployed code things can fail. But they're really useful during development too. It's just if it's happening in user deployed code, you need to get ahead of that because you know if you don't, users will give up using your product. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yes, Tony. Can you give some comment on how to enhance the testability in the use of external library? Um, oh. Should I just play assertion outside of the coding, or like I dig into the source code and just have everything in the library? Uh, so if you're using external libraries, um, uh, there's, there's certainly investments in testability um, which we can invest. I mean, for most external libraries, um, for many external libraries, I should say, we don't have access to the code, or we, if we do have access to the code, it can change over time, 
um, as new versions of the library are, are you know, put out, right? Um, there are some really useful things we can do um, uh, for enhancing testability. One thing is, uh, you know, generally with external libraries, the uh, criteria, the, their preconditions may be specified formally or they may be specified informally, but generally it will, it will say, for example, if this method, you know, if it has a string argument, is that allowed to be null, for example, right? Um, it will say something about what needs to be passed to it. And, uh, and it, there'll be some criteria associated with that. Um, and uh, whether it's in the formal description of it or the name of the argument, um, certain constraints can be clear. You know, if you pass in an index to an array that's also passed, you know, it needs to be um, a valid index, right? It needs to be a, between the first element of the array and the last, right? Uh, commonly zero and and n minus one if n is the length of the array. So if you're dealing with a situation where you have these external functions calls you're using, you generally will... I mean, you can benefit from testing the preconditions for those before you call it, because you want to make sure what you're passing it is legal, right? Um, you don't want to leave that to chance. Um, you often have that chance. You know, you could check that what it's given back is, um, like if it has a post condition, it's returning something non-null, um, that indeed it is, but generally, um, if it isn't, that's a really bad sign. Maybe it's run out of memory or, or what have you. But you could check the return values from it just as a uh, sanity check of your understanding of what it returns. So that, that's not a bad idea. Sometimes what you want to do is um, you know, check that a, uh, a given call, um, for example, is only uh, called once. So maybe this is a, a method that um, should only be called once. And you may want to check in your code, confirm through a counter that this point is only reached at one time. So if, if, if this is only to be called once because it's an initialization routine or whatever, you can check that it's, that it's indeed only called once. Um, there are times where uh, you may Additionally, want to check other criteria like before you call B, A has always been called, right? And, and you could check that with a bit of logic in your code because you know that the library you're calling depends on that fact. And so you, you want to make sure that it's that you're you're adhering to the protocol that it expects. You call A before you call B. Maybe it's initialization before you call, or maybe it's put before you call get, right? And so you may want to, you know, in an assertion, keep track of, of something along those lines. Um uh yeah, those are some things that come to mind there. Um uh I think. You know, when it comes to external APIs, um, sometimes if we're just getting to know them, um, you can put in an assertion that confirms your understanding. So if you put something, um, you could call get and make sure in an assertion that it's that it's in fact there. One of the things about assertions, please please uh, note this. One thing about assertions is that assertions are often, I'm not saying always, but are often disabled in shipping code. So what I mean by that is, if you put in an assertion that has some computational cost, so Tony, maybe I'm using this API for the first time, and, and I don't, you know, I wanna make sure my understanding is correct, that I'm using it properly. I wanna do sanity checks. So when I have my code, I'm, I'm you know, my code is proceeding. I want to have assertions that will check my assumptions as a developer are hold, right? That's what assertions do. They make sure that my assertions are, as a developer, are correct. And so you might, in this API, call put, right? Um, 
Or maybe you call put combined with some computation in your understanding as it should put it in there. But then you have an assertion that calls get to double check that the key is correctly stored with the correct value. That assertion has a cost. Running that assertion will call get. I didn't do something, but maybe, maybe you call something much more heavyweight than that. Maybe you call a thing in the API that has, you know, um, what the largest value in, in the array or, or whether there are duplicates or whatever. But the point is, if you do this in assertions, those will be run during development, but you can disable them. That's a key point. This is a key point. Okay, assertions can be disabled and commonly are. Often we enable some in some modules and disable others. But often assertions are uh, uh, help during development and quality assurance, but get disabled in shipping code. Again, not all, but often we choose to do that. And one, that gives us the freedom, Tony, to do some expensive things and assertions we wouldn't do in shipping code, just to be sure that our assertion, that our assumptions are being met. Do you see what I mean? We we confirm, even though it costs us, we confirm that our assertions are met by calling things in the API that make sure that it's in the same state, that makes sure our assumptions are correct. Do you see what I do? You see what I mean? Now, what do I expect from you, assertions? I expect tons of assertions in your code. I want to see your code chock full of assertions, chock full. I want to see you making heavy use of assertions. Get in the habit, if you're writing code, when you're thinking, what, what do we have to do here? You know, what, what's the next step? You're often thinking about, okay, what am I assuming? What, what's my understanding of the situation? Often it brings up, you're thinking, okay, um, this value is now um, is, is, is now bigger than this, the length of the array or something. Put in an assertion to check these things. You think you've called off to the API to achieve something? Put in an assertion that calls something in the API to confirm that that thing has been done, if, if there is such a possibility, right? That the value has been stored properly, that it's, um, that it's now resized or whatever. Do these things in an assertion because the assertion you can disable at runtime of, for user running code, for code that's been shipped. So why not do that? I want to see your code full of those assertions, okay? Don't hesitate. I mean, just the assertions, you, you may think, well, it costs something computationally. It's going to save you so much time. You can put the extra time into optimization of things that really matter. You know, often, often we're penny-wise pound foolish. We think by making it really low level or by avoiding less call, we're going to make it, you know, far faster. But if Avoiding that call means quality problems go unnoticed. It may it may be a fool's trade off. Um, you're trading gold for for fool's gold or something like that. You're you're um what you're better off doing is making sure the quality is there so that you can spend less time caught up in the debug test cycle which we're going to see is a real bottleneck for a lot of projects. And you can put the extra time you've saved into really important optimizations, into parallelization, investing in multi-threading and multi-core computation, into performant handling of the large data sets you're handling for the beep engine or what have you. You can put your efforts into really impactful optimizations uh, rather than, you know, really uh, small things to push you close to the uh, to a game of logical brinksmanship. So investing in these things and assertions for shipping code can be cost free, and it can allow you to spot problems much sooner. Allow testing to be more effective, and that's why we're linking into this issue of testability. Any other ideas for things that really improve testability? I have a couple more things in my mind. No one's mentioned. Xander it is again. 
Containerization helps. How does containerization help? How many people have used containerization here before? Good. Um, how many people have used it in a previous class before? Okay. Okay. What, 370? Sorry, 332? 353. Okay. Okay. Docker? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, how does containerization help testing? Yes, uh, Xamarin. Yeah, it's a completely well-defined environment, right? All self-contained and sort of completely consistent, whether it's running on a Windows box, a Linux box, a Mac OS box, right? Um, you can configure it to have exactly the same container in place uh, up to the bit level that it's going to be you know, what I mean by that is that it's going to be uh, the, the the running behavior will be bit identical um, across those platforms. So it's really powerful. Uh, so what's another way it helps um, uh, testing? I think Xander was getting at this, but it's an, probably another side of his utterance there. Uh, yes, Jesse. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So you can. You can test um, across environments which you may not have deployed physical machines representing them, but you can you could you could capture them in a container. A container, I think this is what Xander was getting at. It so so one of the old challenges that would often come up with testing is you, you want testing to be reproducible. What do we mean by reproducible? Uh, is it back to you, uh, raising your hand? Yeah. What do you mean by reproducible? So, like, you can have the same test done multiple times and it's like the same thing they've been doing. It always gives the same answer. Always gives this. That's exactly right. Um, so, you want it to be exactly reproducible. And one of the old bugbears, one of the old problems of, of reproducibility was when you run tests, if you don't clean up everything you've done, what's the problem? Let's suppose you just run the test and it's written a bunch of files, put things in the database, and tomorrow you want to run it again and you want the same answer. Could, could you see problems coming? What's the problem? What's the problem? Uh, yeah, and, and is that Mitchell back there? Yeah. Matthew, okay, I'm sorry. Do the M's uh, have it? Yes. Uh, artifacts from previous jobs can interfere with your current That's exactly right. So, so like, there are side effects of the computation. Maybe it wrote to a file, changed the contents. Maybe it wrote to the database, right? Um, and that changes the behavior of the test next time because, you know, it's probing things in the database and has different contents to prob. And so it maybe it, yesterday it didn't encounter an error, but today it does, or vice versa, right? Um, so, so in order for it to be reproducible, systems have to clean up for themselves entirely. And I think what Xander was getting at is when you're starting up a container, it, it doesn't have baggage from the last time it was run. It doesn't have cruft. It, it's starting fresh, anew, tabula rasa, empty slate, right? Um, and that allows you to have a very, uh, very defined, precise environment to achieve reproducibility of tests because it's always starting from exactly the same starting point. So you can do apples to apples tests. You can run the same test multiple times with, with complete confidence that, that it's set up to have exactly the same, the same uh, uh, types of inputs in place, et cetera, the same environment exactly. Yeah. So. So containerization really helps uh, having that reproducible environment. It can help in other things too, isolating different systems that are running, et cetera, but virtualizing so you can run multiple things on the same system where you don't may not have several physical machines, several physical boxes, et cetera. So containerization is great. And I'm uh, and I, I'm a big fan of containerization. Um, 
and uh, and it's a key tool for use in continuous integration pipelines, for use in a lot of development projects. And I've just hinted at some of the uses. There's many others associated with scalability, associated with with the ability to to um, maintain them in a, in a sort of quickly deployable fashion to be able to trust versioning of your system uh, very readily uh, and with clarity um, to have scalability that can spin them up on demand. There's many, and, and security related issues as well. So there's many benefits to containers. And if I were a, a computer science student working towards finishing my degree, I'd sure as heck want to get experience with containerization technologies and other virtualization technologies because they are a foundational technology of our time that in the past 10 years has revolutionized the software development field as well as the, the, the um, distributed computing field and, and um, uh, for high performance system field. Okay, so Xander is exactly right. What are some other things though? Yes, Babs. Modularization. modularization. So there's many forms of modularization. There's pipe and filter modularization. There's there's architectural decomposition, whether it's layers or model view controller architecture, etc. Um, but investing in modular components is is absolutely uh, invaluable for testing. Why do I say that? Why not just have your system as a giant hairball where there's no boundaries, no divisions. It's all, all a Heracleitian mix of things calling off to one another. Yes, uh, there's, a, there's an M back there, and I believe the M is attached to Matthew. Okay, okay. Yeah, as I said, clock is right twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, modularization allows you to attach specific components. So then if something yeah. goes wrong, yeah. it allows you to narrow down where that is. Precisely. Yeah. The fact that we have boundaries, I, there was a time where students in this class would often present me with more hairballish code. So oh, code is performant. We're avoiding function calls. It's, it's going to run much faster. I, I, Okay. That is that is pennywise pound foolish. It is a fool's errand. It is disastrous in its implications across many areas. You can't divide up the work between different people effectively. You can't have these interfaces clearly defined for testing. You can't easily mock things out. You can't easily, you know, go and and and. Uh, debunk it as easily by watching what's what's going on at, at different levels. You can't easily document what part is finished to what's not. You can't specify the interfaces effectively. And to, to quote Shakespeare, as I am often want, in King Lear, that way lies madness. Do not put, do not give me hairballs. Okay? Um, you heard it from me first. Okay? Do not give me hairballs um, of code. They are they are disastrous, but do not give me hairballs for your sake, not, not predominantly for mine. Um, it's um, modularity is the key is it, it, I mean, it's hard to state something more important than modularity for building effective systems. It enables testing, it enables debugging, it enables a division of labor, it enables specifications and, and quality assurance based on them. It enables mocking and the set of technologies associated with that, putting in place stubs. And it, it enables sanity. It enables uh, separation of interface from implementation. Does that statement ring a bell? So, so you clearly delineate the implementation of something from its interface, and that allows you have the freedom to evolve the implementation as long as you're adhering to the interface. If you have a Heraclitian mix, anything can call anything else. A change over here breaks things over there, right? 
I mean, imagine if, if the internet didn't have modularity, you know, me unplugging this video cable here or, or network cable would crash servers over, you know, in, in Australia and China or something like that. It would be, it would be a giant mess. We have modularity to ensure systems that have a degree of uh, separation of concerns. Is the term separation of concerns familiar to people? What does it mean when I say separation of concerns? Somehow I have a feeling that I'm interacting with just one tenth of the class here. So, so what's the separation of concerns? Uh, yes, Bob. Well, like, for example, like in layout architecture, you have that each part is doing one specific thing, and when you're dealing with that thing, you only focus on that. You're not trying to do more than you're supposed to do. Good. Yeah, so you have well-defined roles and, and, and jobs that are, that are um, the, the, you know, that you have certain areas of the system that have certain well-defined roles and jobs different from others. And you have the decomposition of your overall problem into these pieces, which each play a role in taking, you know, in a um, dividing conquer, right? They divide up the problem into well-defined pieces that can be solved. And often those are worked on by different people or different technologies. They have different needs associated with them, and they can evolve independently of each other. They're not coupled, right? We have clear responsibilities in place so that if we change this part of the system, those don't break, right? Because they're orthogonal. They're 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 distinct. Is that familiar? Separation of concern. It's, it's, so you should yearn, as a matter of aesthetics, towards separation of concerns. Just just have a have a natural drive to divide things up in a neat way, have different people responsible for them, different technologies often associated with them, different different uh, testing techniques sometimes associated with them, separation of the data layer from the business logic layer, from the front end, for example, or separation of the interface for the front end, from the output from the front end, model view control. We have separation of concerns um, that achieves higher quality for many reasons. And separation of the interface from an implementation is clear for that. You remember the solid principles, right? It's this key notion of dependency inversion and separating the interface of something from its implementation so we can swap implementations, right? And so we can mock implementations. Does that make sense? So, so we've mentioned a whole bunch of things, right? Containerization, logging, mocking, assertions, specifications, test hooks, modularity, clear names, separation interface and implementation. I even even hit all of them. I mean, there's also use of basic things like code hygiene, good naming conventions, et cetera. These things also help testability by giving clear indication of, of the roles things play. Do any of those things help serve other roles too? Let's take specifications. Does that help other things besides testability? Having clear specifications in part? So, so this again is part of separating interface and implementation. I've, uh, I've, I'm, I'm going to have a, a characterization of the interface where I specify what the preconditions are, what post conditions, right? Or you can have modifies and return value and the preconditions. Does that offer benefits other than than testability? Tony. Uh, isn't for having maintainability and like uh, adding more features to the future. Yeah, that's right. Uh, evolving it, optimizing the system because you can change the implementation and you know the criteria, the new optimized implementation, maybe it's multi-threaded version, still has to meet because it's well-defined. When we, when we have a specification for an interface, we know what we can, what the developers can change and what, because we haven't made any promises about it versus what things can, can, can have to be maintained, what things have to be guaranteed. 
what things the users of this, when they call it, are counting on. Hmm? Uh, so specifications have a benefit. I would argue they also help in development. Why can a specification help in facilitating development? Vision of concerns. Yes, Avi. It keeps you in scope, right? That's right. The people developing it know exactly what job it needs to do, under what conditions it needs to do it, the preconditions, what it has to achieve, the post conditions, so they can avoid scope creep, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, does something like use of containerization have benefits beyond testing? I just said it did a whole bunch, right? With scalability and isolation and security side issues, et cetera. Um, do, does the use of scripting or test harnesses, the ability to, to support those sort of interfaces, can that help other things besides testing? Darn right, there's a lot of extra uses of scripting um, beyond, uh, beyond testing. Does separation of interface from implementation have benefits beyond testing? Darn right it does. Uh, again, division of labor, um, uh, a, a, the ability to tap different technologies for different areas of, of a system or to change those technologies, et cetera. All these things are aspects of testability, okay? um, but they, they also confer benefits extending well beyond us. And I want to see all of them in use. Okay. I want to see, I want to see these. I, I, I shouldn't say all of them. I mean, there may be some projects here that make use of containerization, some that don't. No, that's fine. But I want to see, you know, assertions, mocking, logging, specifications, probably some test hooks, good naming, good commenting, modularity, clear separation of concerns. Um, all those should be uh, gimmies, okay? And that's what I want to see in place. Okay, I'm going to stop my comments here. Um, 